Good morning, my dear professors and colleagues. It's my pleasure and great honor to share with you this very important lecture about clinical tips in cardiovascular emergencies. Cardiovascular diseases are the most prevalent worldwide. It is the leading global cause of death, accounting for 15 million deaths in 2015. Cardiovascular disease often present in emergency situation. Prompt treatment is essential to reduce mortality. Out of hospital, cardiac arrest is one of the most dreadful condition, leading to over 90% mortality rate. Time is gold has always been the cornerstone of cardiovascular emergency management. For example, in patients with STEMI, every 30 minute delay in door to balloon time translates into 7.5% relative increase in the mortality. And as we see in this nice diagram, we can appreciate that about 50% of the leading causes of deaths are sudden cardiac arrest causes. So what is the spectrum of cardiovascular emergencies? This is the list of the most important and the most common cardiac emergencies and we will have a look on each one in a rapid review. The spectrum include acute chest pain, acute dyspnea, syncope, tachyarrhythmia such as VT or VF, atrial fibrillation or supraventricular tachycardia, or bradyarrhythmia such as heart block or asystole, hypotension and shock, either cardiac tamponade due to massive pericardial effusion or cardiogenic shock, hypertensive crisis including hypertensive urgency and the hypertensive emergency, and finally, cardiac arrest. So let's see this case scenario. A 68-year-old obese man is brought in by ambulance to emergency room, complaining of abrupt onset of chest discomfort for the past hour. He describes severe aching under the distal aspect of his sternum with radiation into the inferior left side of his chest. His symptoms started at rest, have been constant and worsen when he takes a deep breath. He has a history of acid reflux disease, alcoholism, dyslipidemia and hypertension, prostate cancer and strong family history of myocardial infarction. On examination, the patient appear restless and in modest distress. The vital signs are temperature 37, heart rate 112 beat per minute, blood pressure 80 over 60 millimeter mercury in the left arm and 85 over 65 millimeter mercury in the right arm. His respiratory rate is 26 cycle per minute and the oxygen saturation is 90% on room air. The patient's breathing is labored with normal breath sound. He has a tachycardic regular rhythm without murmurs, rub or gallop. And the epigastrium is mildly tender to palpation and his stool is negative for occult blood. So the first question is, what are the priority diagnoses to evaluate and what are your next diagnostic steps? 
and the ideal and the correct answer is chest pain undifferentiated. So the summary of this case is we have a 68-year-old man present with vague substernal and left-sided chest pain for one hour and his pain is associated with dyspnea, tachypnea and the unstable vital signs including a hypotension, tachycardia and the relative hypoxia. He is currently in respiratory distress and triage should focus on differentiating between possible life-threatening etiologies of his symptoms that require urgent attention. This patient has risk factors for thromboembolic disease, which include obesity and malignancy, cardiovascular disease, including obesity, age, gender, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and a strong family history, risk factors for peptic ulcer disease, including acid reflux and alcoholism, as such, the differential should initially be kept broad and narrowed once life-threatening causes are ruled out. Priority differential diagnosis or the can't-miss diagnoses include pulmonary embolism, acute coronary syndrome, aortic dissection, and tension pneumothorax since these are potentially fatal conditions. The next diagnostic steps including ECG, chest X-ray, and labs including cardiac biomarkers and arterial blood gases, and we should consider contrast-enhanced CT of the chest. So how to approach patient with chest pain? At first, we have to define some term. What is meant by acute coronary syndrome? Acute coronary syndrome include patient with unstable angina, non-ST elevation myocardial infarction, or ST elevation myocardial infarction. Function. So, when we have a patient with suspected acute coronary syndrome, we ask for ECG. If there is ST elevation, then we have an ST elevation myocardial infarction if the cardiac biomarkers are positive, but we don't wait for cardiac biomarkers in ST elevation. If the ECG didn't show ST elevation, including the normal ECG, but with typical chest pain, then we have a non-ST elevation, acute coronary syndrome. If the enzymes are positive, then we have a case of non-STEMI or non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. If the cardiac biomarkers are negative, then we have a case of unstable angina. What is meant by PCI? Percutaneous coronary intervention. Percutaneous coronary intervention is a catheter-based therapy by which blood flow is restored to the an occluded coronary artery by balloon angioplasty or stenting. The differential diagnosis of chest pain is extensive and it is usually due to benign causes. Some causes of chest pain may be life-threatening. As such, for each patient presenting with chest pain, serious causes should be ruled out before less dangerous conditions are considered. The most important causes of chest pain include cardiovascular causes such as acute coronary syndrome, aortic dissection, stable angina, pericarditis or myocarditis, respiratory causes such as pulmonary embolism, 
pneumothorax, pneumonia, and pleurisy. GIT causes including GERD, GERD or gastroesophageal reflux, peptic ulcer disease, cholecystitis or pancreatitis, and the other causes include the musculoskeletal causes, costochondritis or anxiety. Non-emergent chest pain evaluated in the primary office care is most often due to musculoskeletal pain, followed by the GIT causes, and less commonly due to cardiac causes, most of which are stable angina, while acute chest pain in patients with risk factor for coronary artery disease will be more likely to be cardiac in origin in patients older than 40%, up to 50% of cases will be due to cardiac causes. So when we have a patient with a chest pain, we must take a detailed history, include chest pain analysis, we must focus on the onset, course, and the duration of the chest pain, site and radiation, character and duration, precipitating and relieving factors, associated symptoms, and severity. And we should ask about the risk factors to identify the type of patient, including diabetes, hypertension, smoking, obesity, family history, age, prior similar attacks, prolonged immobilization, recent surgery, or use of oral contraceptive pills. The history suggestive of myocardial infarction include retrosternal chest pain that radiate to the left shoulder or right shoulder or both or radiating to the back or lower jaw or to the epigastrium, compressing in character or burning chest pain or heaviness, and it lasts for more than 20 minutes, precipitated by physical or emotional stress and relieved by rest or sublingual nitrates and associated with vomiting, sweating, dyspnea, and syncope. The risk factor and the type of patient in patients presenting with myocardial infarction include diabetes, hypertension, obesity, dyslipidemia, family history, old age, or prior similar attacks of typical chest pain. We have a very important tips here. Normal ECG doesn't rule out acute coronary syndrome. Don't allow patient presenting to the ER at night with acute chest pain to go home. Presentations may be atypical in elderly women and diabetics. Up to one third of these patients may not experience the classic ischemic chest pain with myocardial infarction. Rather, they can present with dyspnea in form of angina equivalent or fatigue, syncope, arrhythmia, acute heart failure, or even silent infarction. And epigastric pain may be sign of inferior infarction. What is the history suggestive of aortic dissection? As regard chest pain analysis, we will have a history of sudden tearing chest pain referring to the back in the interscapular region and it is severe pain from the start. And as regards the type of patient, usually male patient, smoker with uncontrolled hypertension, or patients with 
Marfan syndrome. We have a very important tip here. The possibility of aortic dissection should be excluded in every patient with acute coronary syndrome as antiplatelet and anticoagulant as well as thrombolytic therapy are contraindicated and will be catastrophic in patients with aortic dissection. What is the history suggestive of pneumothorax? As regard chest pain analysis, we will have a pleuritic chest pain, which means a stitching localized chest pain that increase with cuff or deep inspiration or positional pain and associated with severe dyspnea. The type of patient a spontaneous pneumothorax classically occur in tall patients, those with cystic fibrosis, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency following trauma to the chest or iatrogenic, or patient with long history of chest problem such as COPD or bronchial asthma. Very important tip here, any patient with chest pain and the normal ECG should have a chest X-ray to look for pneumothorax or wide mediastinum. History suggestive of pulmonary embolism. As regard chest pain analysis, it can present either by typical chest pain or pleuritic chest pain, a stitching localized chest pain that increase with cuff or deep inspiration or positional pain, and it is associated with severe unexplained dyspnea. And the risk factors include prolonged immobilization, recent surgery, oral contraceptive pills, malignancy, or pregnancy. A very important tip here, any patient with unexplained dyspnea with normal chest X-ray should be considered pulmonary embolism until proved otherwise. So what are the less urgent causes of chest pain that may mimic myocardial infarction? The first cause can be pericarditis. Pain is typically better when leaning forward and may be pleuritic. Myocarditis may be preceded by recent flu-like illness. Pneumonia may be associated with fever, chills, cough, and leukocytosis. Peptic ulcer, the pain is more epigastric, reproducible, and may be associated with peritoneal signs if perforated, pancreatitis, cholecystitis, or musculoskeletal pain, which is always a diagnosis of exclusion. We should focus on the following in physical examination. Vital signs assessment is very essential in the early evaluation of chest pain. In patients with pulmonary embolism, we will observe that there is evidence of tachycardia and tachypnea even if the patient is not hypoxic. In patients with aortic dissection, there will be a blood pressure difference of more than 20 millimeter mercury between both arms. In pericardial examination, we can observe the S4 or mitral regurgitation murmur in patients with acute coronary syndrome, aortic regurgitation murmur in patients with aortic dissection, or distant heart sound in patient with pneumothorax. Chest examination. We can 
here find bilateral basal crepitation if the acute coronary syndrome is complicated by heart failure we can observe a unilateral bulge or limited chest expansion in patient with pneumothorax as well as hyper resonance by percussion and diminished breath sound very important tip here the physical examination may be completely normal in patient with life-threatening chest pain as such a normal exam may be falsely assuring and diagnostic test should be done what are the most important diagnostic testing in patient with acute chest pain the first one and the most important is ECG ECG should be obtained within 10 minutes of arrival to the emergency department to rule out acute MI we can consider asking for chest x-ray looking for wide mediastinum suggestive of aortic dissection or evidence of pneumothorax we can consider echocardiography to look for evidence of regional wall motion abnormalities with acute myocardial infarction or for assessment of dissection flab in patient with aortic dissection we can consider CT especially the treble rule out protocol including CT aortography, CT pulmonary angiography, CT coronary angiography to rule out aortic dissection, pulmonary embolism or underlying coronary artery disease. We can also consider some labs such as D-dimer elevated in patient with pulmonary embolism or cardiac enzymes or arterial blood gases this is an example for ECG showing STEMI ST elevation myocardial infarction on the left side we can see a case of anterior myocardial infarction ST elevation in the anterior precordial leads and on the right side we can see a case of inferior myocardial infarction st elevation in the inferior leads with reciprocal st depression in one and the evl on the left side we can see a classic example for lateral st elevation myocardial infarction and on the right side we can see a posterior STEMI which is often underdiagnosed or missed it can be diagnosed by observing a tall R from V1 to V3 and ST depression rather than ST elevation it is a reciprocal or mirror image of the ST elevation myocardial infarction. Tall R instead of the pathological Q wave and the ST depression instead of the ST elevation from V1 to V3. What are the STEMI equivalents? The STEMI equivalents include the D winter sign which is defined as hyper acute t with upsloping st depression in the anterior precordial leads which is suggestive of acute led occlusion or willing sign which is seen as biphasic or symmetrically inverted T wave from V1 to V4. It is suggestive of proximal LED occlusion. 
The STEMI equivalent also include right bundle branch block or left bundle branch block. Presence of right bundle or left bundle in patient with acute chest pain should be considered a STEMI equivalent and should be referred immediately for primary PCI as this pattern can mask the ECG signs of ST elevation. The other option is to depend on the Scarboza criteria. The ECG pattern in patient with non STEMI include normal ECG. This is very important as we can have a patient with myocardial infarction with totally normal ECG. About 50% of patient with non-ST elevation myocardial infarction or non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome have a normal or non-diagnostic ECG changes. So the diagnosis will be based mainly on the typical clinical presentation and the typical description of uh, ischemic chest pain. The other possibility is to see ST depression. If we have an ST depression in eight or more leads with ST elevation of uh, EV in EVR, this is could be a left main disease or multi vessel disease. The ECG finding in pulmonary embolism include S1Q3 T3 pattern, which means deep S in lead 1, pathological Q wave in lead 3, and inverted T wave in lead 3. The other finding include sinus tachycardia, right axis, incomplete right bundle, T wave inversion in the inferior and anteroceptal leads. New onset atrial fibrillation could be the first sign of pulmonary embolism in hospitalized patients. And this is the classic chest x-ray for patient with aortic dissection. We can notice the markedly dilated aortic arch, descending aorta, and ascending aorta as well. And the classic uh, X-ray of uh, pneumothorax include a jet black opacity with hyperinflated lung. And this is uh, the classic CT appearance of aortic dissection with evidence of dissection flab marked by the red arrow. And this is another example for aortic dissection, including dissection in the arch, dissection in the descending aorta, and the dissection flab as seen from the coronal view. And this is a nice example for patient with pulmonary embolism with a filling defect extending to the both right and the left pulmonary arteries marked by the red arrow. This is the echo picture for the aortic dissection. We can see the dissection flap in the ascending aorta and the evidence of severe aortic regurgitation. Very important tips here. Never to wait for cardiac enzymes in patient with STEMI. The dimer is a good negative test. 
but it should be only used in patient with low or intermediate probability of pulmonary embolism in patient with high probability of pulmonary embolism we should go directly for CT pulmonary angiography as if the patient is high probability of pulmonary embolism and the D-dimer testing was negative it is mostly false negative testing the first set of cardiac enzymes may be normal and you should ask for serial cardiac enzymes in patients suspected to have acute myocardial infarction so what is the initial management of acute coronary syndrome we must give loading doses of dual antiplatelet therapy including aspirin 300 mg of acetyl salicylic acid cheopol and we must give loading dose of P2Y12 inhibitor either clobidogrel 300 mg or ticagrelor 180 mg in certain cases and we must give a pain relief either morphia or sublingual nitrates then we should consider reperfusion or revascularization as regard patient with STEMI we should immediately proceed for primary PCI and the patient with STEMI who can't receive PCI within 120 minutes should be considered for thrombolytic therapy such as streptokinase or altiblaze whereas the lytic therapy are contraindicated in patient with non-STEMI for non-STEMI, if not high risk, PCI can be delayed for up to 72 hours and the patient with high risk non-STEMI, including persistent chest pain, heart failure, electrical instability, should proceed immediately to PCI. The other lines of management include anticoagulation, ACE inhibitor, beta blocker statins and the proton bump inhibitor how to manage aortic dissection patient with aortic dissection are typically emergently treated with intravenous beta blocker to decrease the heart rate blood pressure and the shear force of the blood along the arterial wall together with nitroprusside to result in afterload reduction Type A aortic dissection, which involves the ascending aorta, should be referred for urgent surgery, while type B aortic dissection, which didn't include or involve the ascending aorta, may be initially managed medically, and surgery should be reserved for patient with refractory pain or evidence of end organ hypoperfusion. How to manage a pneumothorax? In case of simple uncomplicated pneumothorax, patients are typically monitored closely with serial chest x ray. 100% oxygen may be empirically administered to increase the rate of absorption. Patient with tension pneumothorax, usually unstable on presentation, require urgent needle thoracotomy in the second intercostal space, midclavicular line. This immediately relieves the pressure and a chest tube may be placed surgically immediately thereafter management of pulmonary embolism include parenteral and oral anticoagulation thrombolytic therapy if there is evidence of hemodynamic instability or shock and oxygen 
What about the management of tachyarrhythmia? Any patient presenting with tachyarrhythmia and hemodynamic instability, we must go for synchronized DC cardioversion. What is the management of bradyarrhythmia? You can give up to 3 mg atropine, 0.5 mg every 5 minutes. Always suspect a hyperkalemia, and if so, you should give the anti-hyperkalemic measures, including slow intravenous calcium gluconate over 15 minutes, 100 cc glucose 25%, with 10 units of rapid acting insulin, nebulizer with beta agonist such as farcoline, diuretics such as lasix, and sodium bicarb if there is evidence of acidosis, and always refer for possible temporary or permanent pacemaker. And this is a typical example for hyperkalemia we can appreciate the very wide QRS and the evidence of hyperacute T-wave and the presence of sine wave which means merging of the QRS and the T-wave to form one complex and no evidence of ST segment. What about cardiac tamponade? The clinical diagnosis of cardiac tamponade depends mainly on the PEX triad, which include hypotension, jugular venous distension, and the muffled heart sound. The ECG triad for cardiac tamponade include sinus tachycardia, low voltage, and electrical alternance. And in echo, we can appreciate the presence of the pericardial effusion, evidence of RV diastolic collapse, and the dilated IVC. What is meant by hypertensive crisis? Hypertensive crisis include hypertensive urgency, which means Elevated blood pressure without evidence of acute end organ damage, or hypertensive emergency, which means elevated blood pressure with evidence of acute end organ damage. According to the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology Diagnostic Algorithm and uh, the management strategy of patient with hypertensive crisis. The hypertensive crisis is diagnosed when we have a systolic blood pressure above 180 millimeter mercury plus or minus diastolic blood pressure more than 120 millimeter mercury. We look for evidence of target organ damage, either new or progressive or worsening if there is no evidence and only markedly elevated blood pressure we can consider to reinstitute the drugs to intensify the oral antihypertensive drugs and arrange for close follow-up if there is evidence of target organ damage then we have a case of hypertensive emergency the patient must be admitted to the ICU and we should exclude the evidence of aortic dissection or severe preeclampsia or eclampsia or fucromocytoma crisis. If any of them is present, we have to reduce the systolic blood pressure below 140 millimeter mercury during the first hour and to less than 120 millimeter mercury in case of aortic dissection if there is no evidence of the previous conditions we should consider reducing the blood pressure 
maximally by 25% over the first hour then to 160 over 100 to 110 millimeter mercury over the next two to six hours then back to normal over the next 24 to 48 hours the hypertensive emergencies include stroke or eclampsia or acute renal failure pulmonary edema aortic dissection acute coronary syndrome or babyledema or hypertensive encephalopathy the management of hypertensive crisis if we have a case of hypertensive urgency we have to manage on outpatient basis or same day observation and to adjust the oral antihypertensive drugs and the goal is to reduce the blood pressure by no more than 25% of the mean arterial blood pressure in the first 24 hours. While in patient with hypertensive emergency, we should admit the patient in the ICU and to give parenteral drugs with aim of reduction of the blood pressure by about 10% from the mean arterial blood pressure within the first hour then 15% reduction in the next two to three hours the management of hypertensive crisis according to the american college of cardiology american heart association guidelines 2017 in patient with hypertensive urgency there is no indication for immediate reduction of blood pressure in emergency department or hospitalization while in patient with hypertensive emergency we must admit the patient and to give parenteral antihypertensive drug aiming to reduce the systolic blood pressure by 25 percent within the first hour and to 160 over 100 in the next two to six hours and back to normal in the next 24 to 48 hours very important tips here sublingual nifedipine or epilate is absolutely contraindicated and no longer used as it can lead to acute severe lowering of blood pressure with subsequent cerebral hypoperfusion and stroke diuretics and lasix is not used in hypertensive urgency it is used only in hypertensive emergency in form of acute pulmonary edema with evidence of volume overload the last and the most catastrophic cardiac emergency is cardiac arrest and the most important causes of cardiac arrest include hypovolemia, hypoxia, acidosis, hyperkalemia, hypokalemia, hypothermia, and hypoglycemia, toxins, tamponade, tension pneumothorax, thrombosis, either coronary thrombosis or pulmonary embolism, and trauma. In patient with cardiac arrest, we must follow the basic life support and advanced life support algorithm, putting in mind the difference between the shockable arrhythm, including VF or pulseless VT. We should give non-synchronized DC cardioversion for these cases or the non-shockable arrhythm, including the bradyarrhythmia or Systole. Let's discuss another case scenario. A 68 year old man with no medical history present to the emergency department with chest pain for the past 30 minutes. The ECG showed ST elevation from V3 to V6 and in lead 1 and EVL. The hospital is not equipped for 
PCI and the nearest hospital that perform PCI is three hours away. The vital signs is heart rate 110 beat per minute, blood pressure 180, 150 over 84, respiratory rate 18 cycle per minute and the oxygen saturation 98% on the room air. In addition to aspirin and intravenous heparin, what is the most appropriate next step? Administration of full dose thrombolysis and the transfer to the nearest PCI capable hospital for angiography or administration of full dose thrombolysis and the subsequent transfer only if the patient is unstable or administration of half dose thrombolysis and the transfer to the nearest PCI capable hospital for immediate PCI or medical management with addition of clobido grill? And the correct answer is A, administration of full dose thrombolysis and transfer to the nearest PCI capable hospital for angiography. Patients who present to the hospital not equipped for PCI who are more than 100 20 minutes from the nearest BCI capable hospital should be given thrombolysis unless contraindicated. Angiography can be performed after then and BCI carried out if reperfusion is not complete. Trials of half dose lytic therapy and immediate BCI, which called facilitated BCI haven't shown favorable results and this strategy is not advised anymore. Another case, a 70-year-old female with history of hypertension, coronary artery disease, smoking, present with tearing chest pain across the chest that radiate to the back for the past one hour. Her vital signs include heart rate 100 beat per minute, blood pressure 190 over 110 millimeter mercury, the respiratory rate 18 cycle per minute, and the oxygen saturation is 97% on room air. CT chest with contrast shows an evidence of aortic dissection extending 1 cm distal to the left subclavian artery to 2 cm superior to the renal arteries. What is the most appropriate management strategy? Immediate surgery or administration of intravenous labetalol, nitroglycerin, and surgery when stable, administration of intravenous heparin, intravenous metoprolol, and to continue monitoring, Administration of intravenous heparin, intravenous nitroproside, intravenous metoprolol, and continuous monitoring. Administration of intravenous metoprolol, intravenous nitroproside, and continuous monitoring. And the correct answer is E. Administration of intravenous metoprolol, intravenous nitroproside, and continuous monitoring. This patient has a type B aortic dissection, which may be managed medically with intravenous metoprolol and intravenous nitroproside. Intravenous lapitalol doesn't reduce the shear force of the blood along the arterial wall as well as metoprolol. And the nitroglycerin is generally considered inferior to nitroproside for afterload reduction. Surgery is not required unless the aneurysm continue to extend or evidence of complication and intravenous heparin is absolutely contraindicated. An 18-year-old man present with chest pain and dyspnea with deep breathing for the past one hour 
The vital signs are stable chest X-ray show a small pneumothorax involving 10% of the area of the left lung. What is the most appropriate management strategy? Needle thoracotomy of the second left intercostal space midclavicular line or placement of chest tube or to give oxygen and serial x-ray over the next 24 hours or to give albuterol inhalation 100% oxygen and chest physical therapy. The correct answer is C. 100% oxygen and serial chest x-ray over the next 24 hours. This young patient has a simple uncomplicated pneumothorax which may be monitored with serial chest x-ray for stability. No urgent intervention is required and 100% oxygen may help it to reabsorb it. needle thoracotomy and the chest tube are therapies reserved for tension pneumothorax. Another example, a 45-year-old man with history of hypertension and lung cancer present with pleuritic chest pain, left cuff swelling after a 4-hour plane flight. He is tachycardic, hypoxic, but otherwise stable. What is the most appropriate next step in the management? To obtain a left lower extremity venous ultrasound or lower limb duplex, to obtain a CT chest with contrast, to obtain a bedside echo, to check the D-dimer level or empirical administration of intravenous unfractionated heparin. And the correct answer is to obtain a CT chest with contrast or CT pulmonary angiography. This patient likely has a pulmonary embolism caused by a left lower extremity deep venous thrombosis. So the next best step is to obtain CT chest with contrast to confirm the diagnosis. In patient with renal insufficiency, a venous ultrasound to confirm DVT may be sufficient to infer or to confirm the diagnosis, but it is less ideal. A bedside echo is typically unnecessary unless the right heart needs to be assessed in patient with signs of hemodynamic instability. The D-dimer testing is reasonable to rule out pulmonary embolism in patient with low or intermediate probability. However, this may be falsely elevated in this patient with lung cancer. Thank you.